What a year, huh? Can you imagine jumping out of that craft? How, how many miles was he up? It's just insanity. Insanity. 2012, I think, was a really interesting year. And if I had to sum it up into one word, I'd probably use the word unsettling. Uh, really cool things going on, but really troubling things going on at the same time. This past week, I ran into a friend of mine who's a leader at Bonet Shalom. That's the conservative uh, Jewish temple here in Boulder. And she asked me, she said, are your services like crazy? Are they, are they busy? And I said, yeah, our numbers are up quite a bit. And then she said, well, us too, people are stressed out about what's, you know, the crazy things that are taking place in the world today. They're coming in and they're, they're asking what's going on. And and many of you here at Cornerstone are asking us the same questions. You want to know things like, why are most of the major governments on this planet in a financial crisis? Why do we see so many crazy murder, murder-suicides, mass murders coming out of the woodwork? Why is uh, Islamic radicalism spreading around the world like wildfire? And um, many of your questions are about what's happening in the Middle East, and particularly what's going on in Israel. Here at Cornerstone... We often talk about the Bible and life itself. We use the term the big story, the meta-narrative, the, the story above all the other stories that are going on in the world. And we see the pages of our Bible from the book of Genesis all the way to the, the book of Revelation as one seamless story from beginning to end written and produced by God himself if you think about it, before the beginning of time, God was, was sitting in, in eternity and he conceived of this wild, mysterious, nail-biting, epic drama that he pressed the play button in Genesis 1 and it'll eventually end when he presses the stop button in, in Revelation 22. It's not the end, it's just a new beginning. And in between the pages of these two books in the Bible, God has provided literally hundreds and hundreds of details about how his story, history, would play out over time. And not only has every detail so far played out exactly the way God said it would, hundreds of details have played out exactly the way God said that they would. We're only down to a few more details before the story ends. And I know just even thinking about this subject makes a lot of people nervous and uneasy because it tends to bring out all the creepy conspiracy theory people who would have us think that even children's channel like Nickelodeon is really a tool of Satan just to deceive our, 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 uh, our kids into believing the wrong things. Or it tends to bring out all the fear-mongering preppers who want to scare us into buying a lot of guns and, and gold and stocking up our basement with survivalist supplies. But this message is not about any of that. I'm not saying it's not smart to be prepared for, for things, but what, I'm is saying, what I am saying is this message is merely about trying to figure out the best that we can, where are we in the big story in light of the events that took place in 2012? And then looking at how God says we should really be living our lives in 2013 in light of those events. So please don't tune out thinking this is just another predictable end times message because it's not. And I guarantee that you'll find this message at the very least insightful and interesting and at the very most, I hope you find it helpful and encouraging in navigating through 2013. And so in order to understand the unsettling events of 2012, um, I want us to look at a couple things that I think are really important. And the first one is understanding the key role that God gave to the Jewish people in the big story. This is part of our, our story as well. It's important to understand, and, I, and, and this is the place I want to start. So listen to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 through 9, it says that the Lord your God has chosen you, meaning the Jewish people, to be a people for his treasured, treasured possession out of all the people's who are on the face of the earth. So in other words, of all, all the other ethnic groups in the world, God chose the Jewish people for a special purpose. And it was, he didn't choose them because they were more in number than any other people. 
that the Lord set his love on them and chose them, but because for they are the fewest people, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your forefathers. And so what oath or what promise is being talked about here? It's the promise that God made now over 4,000 years ago to an over-the-hill, childless, and homeless couple named Abraham and Sarah. That even though they were beyond childbearing years, and even though they owned no property, God promised them that they would make them that they would, he would give them a big family and a prime piece of real estate for them to live in called the promised land. And here's two important aspects to understand about this promise. This is so important to get. If you don't get this, it's going to be hard to understand the big story. Number one, God would take the entire span of history before he would completely fulfill his promise to the Jewish people. Has not been fulfilled yet. Not completely. And number two, the Jewish people would be the constant center of intense drama until God completely fulfills his promises to them. And I don't know if you know or not, but there's been over 60 major genocidal attempts against the Jewish people since God made this promise over 4,000 years ago. There's also been dozens and dozens of attempts to subjugate the Jews throughout history and a countless number of vicious attacks against Jewish groups and individuals. We even have an official name that we, we, we have for this phenomenon in history. It's called anti-Semitism, which is defined as a hostile belief or behavior towards uh, Jews simply for being Jewish. It's... it's it's an unexplainable phenomenon, and yes, it happens in our world today. The Bible records many of these anti-Semitic events, whether it's the Egyptian slavery mentioned in the book of Exodus, the Babylonian exile mentioned by most of the prophets, or Haman's genocidal attack mentioned in the book of Esther. And almost every people group on this planet has taken a shot at some form of hatred toward the Jewish people at one time or another throughout history, including our history, Christians and Christianity. Not all, but, but a significant number of Christians uh, have, taken have, have taken place of Jewish hatred, whether it's by subjugating and killing the Jews in the name of Jesus during the Crusades and the Inquisitions, or by teaching a doctrine that God revoked his promise to the Jewish people and made the church the new recipients of his promise after the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah and killed Jesus on the cross. It's well and alive today in our world. Like it or not, believe it or not, ever since God made his promise to the Jewish people, they've been and they remain to this day the center of intense drama. And it's all because God chose them to play a key role throughout the entire big story. Uh, I, I've quoted this line from the Fiddler on the Roof many times. Tevye says it well. God, I know we're your chosen people, but can you choose someone else once in a while? <laughs> so as a Jew, I get this thing. Okay, in order to understand the unsettling events of 2012, we also need to understand the key role that God gave to the center of to the city of Jerusalem in the big story. Second Chronicles 33, 7 says that in this house, meaning the temple that Solomon built, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name there forever. And it seems like he's mentioning two spots here, but he's really only mentioning one. And he's talking about the temple mount located in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Here's a picture of that area. This is just a small area of the Temple Mount. This happens to be, if the temple were still around today, this would be the location of the Holy of Holies. That's the western wall that you see that group of people crowding against. They come there for prayer. Behind it, you've got the, 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 the Dome of the Mosque, which is the, the Dome of the Rock, which is the gold dome there, and you've got the al Aska Mosque. That's actually the place where Muslims go to pray. Um, 
And here's what you got to understand. I mean, this is, I mean, I hope you kind of get into the drama of all this. Way back in, in, in early part of Genesis, he comes, God comes to Abraham after pr- fulfilling at least part of this promise. He gives Abraham and Sarah a son named Isaac. When Isaac is about 12 years old, God says, take your son and go to the place. That's all he calls it. Go to the place that I'm going to send you. And Abraham takes his son there, and they get to this place. They go up right onto that mount right there where there's a, a cornerstone. There's a rock. The, the, the gold dome is built over the place where, where uh, Abraham would have taken Isaac to be sacrificed. And Isaac knows there's going to be a sacrifice. And he, he, goes, he goes, well, okay, I see the wood, and I see the fire, but uh, hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, in faith, knowing God's, you know, he can't take Isaac. I mean, he's, he's fulfilling the promise, goes through with this thing, and he tells, he tells his son, God will provide a lamb. A prophecy, not only of that moment, that God would provide the sacrifice, but that a greater sacrifice would come later on in history. A few hundred years later, God tells Solomon to build the temple on that same spot, the place where spotless lambs will be sacrificed year after year for the atonement for sin. But the lamb that God promised, the ultimate lamb, still hadn't shown up. It would take another several hundred years before the ultimate spotless lamb of God, God himself in the form of Yeshua, Jesus, sacrifices his own blood on that very mount to atone for the sins of mankind once and for all. It's so important to understand that all three of these events throughout his, in history are build upon each other and are intimately linked together as critical events in the big story. God wrote an enormous role for this place And it's the only spot on earth where God says he chose to mark it with his name forever. And for this reason, some call it the epicenter of the universe. But however you think about Jerusalem, you'd be blind not to notice that it's been and it continues to be a flashpoint in history. During the course of it... uh, Of its history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times. It's been besieged 23 times. It's been captured and recaptured 44 times. It's been destroyed two times. Since God settled the Jews in Israel way back in ancient times, Jerusalem has been conquered by the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then the Muslims, and then the Christian Crusaders, then the Mamluks, and then the Ottomans, and then the, the, the British. In 1948, after being exiled from their, their homeland for over 2,000 years, the Jewish people were miraculously, miraculously given back part of their land, just one of the hundreds of details that were given in advance by the prophets that we were told in advance. But that move caused an ongoing conflict between the Jews and the Palestinians in Israel, which rages today and is increasing in intensity. And as you read the headlines and you hear of places in Israel like Gaza and the West Bank and the Golan Heights and the settlements, and you hear about a two-state solution to separate Jews and Palestinians as a way to bring peace between these two groups, Keep your eyes and your ears open to discover the deeper spiritual reason why no peace deal has ever been forged over the last 65 years. I mean, here you're looking at a picture of the Western Wall. Those are really literally hundreds and hundreds of people, and there are thousands of people, Jews, who come every day to pray at that wall. On the other side of that wall, you've got thousands and thousands of Muslims who come to pray each day in the Alaska Mosque. And no deal has ever been forged 
because the Muslims declared this spot to be the third holiest site in Islam, even though its undisputed construction and history belong solely to the Jews. And you know, the Middle East desperately needs a peace plan. The situation there for Palestinians and the situation there for Jews is bad, and particularly for the Palestinians. And it desperately needs a peace plan. And you and I should want there to be a peace plan. God loves Palestinians just as much as he loves Jews. Don't ever think otherwise. But Jerusalem, the epicenter of the universe, the place where the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob put his name forever, is a battleground, both in the physical realm and the spiritual realm. Because God wrote into the big story a plan for this city that cannot be stopped. And that's why we can't ever get Jerusalem or the Jewish people out of the headlines. It's the place where God put his name forever. And the frequency and the intensity of those headlines are only going to increase as we get closer and closer to what's called the last chapter of the big story when God finally does fulfill his promise to the Jewish people completely. I mentioned earlier in this message that God has given us hundreds upon hundreds of details about how the big story would unfold throughout history and that only a few of those details are left before the story ends. Well, we're told by the prophet Zechariah about some horrible events that come for the Jewish people and Jerusalem just before the Messiah returns. In Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 2, it says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. And he's speaking about this day in the last chapter of the story. And he says, This day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city will be taken and houses plundered and the women raped and half the city shall go into exile but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And so this is obviously a, a terrible situation. It's a horrible time because at some point in the future it says all the nations are going to turn against Jerusalem. And somehow they're going to gather together to battle against her. The city is overtaken. Houses are plundered. Women are raped. Half the population is taken into exile, which means they have to leave. Only half of the population is left. And I know, you know, it might be hard to imagine that how can all the nations, all the governments of the world turn against Israel? But if you've been reading the headlines recently, then you know that more and more Israel is losing allies every week and I don't think it's too difficult to imagine something that the crazy Israeli government can do in the near future that would tip the scale of rejection and animosity against them and however this happens I, I have no clue how it's gonna happen but however this happens Eventually, things escalate to a point when Israel is basically on her own to face an insurmountable evil army raging against her. But the hope, the hope is that Zechariah tells us in the very next verse that when it looks like it's curtains for the Jewish people, God himself shows up to save the day. In verse 3, it says, Then, then, meaning when it looks like it's just curtains, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. When God fights, I don't know if you noticed, he always wins. <laughs> and on that day, it says, His feet, he will land on the Mount of Olives. 
Now, who are we talking about here? It says the Lord. And it's a physical manifestation of the Lord. And when we see physical manifestation of the Lord, it's the Messiah. It's Jesus returning. It is the second coming. And his feet are going to hit on the, the mount right next to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, um, to the temple mount on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to walk down into the Kidron Valley and up onto the temple mount. And he's going to make everything groovy for the world. I didn't write this story. You know, it's a crazy, crazy story. And God didn't consult me when he wrote it because I would have recommended, you know, let's get the outrageous drama stuff. Let's get that on the cutting room floor. Why do we need that? Why do we have to have pain and suffering and why do we even need headlines? But my guess is that if all the other details of the story have come to pass, and they have, every one of them, just the way God wrote it, then this one will eventually come to pass as well. And I think, you know, if you, if you peruse the headlines, and if we're really honest with ourselves, we can already see the stage being set for something like this to play out in the Middle East. Why? Because over 4,000 years ago, God came to an over-the-hill, childless, homeless couple and made them a promise to give them a large family and a prime piece of real estate. And God's going to keep his promise because that's how God rolls. He's a promise keeper. In fact, we need him to keep this promise because if he doesn't keep his promise to them why should he keep or why should we trust that he'll keep his promise to us but until that time the dark spiritual forces of evil will do what they've always done in their role in the big story only this time they will do it with a vengeance as they unleash every evil tool they have in their bag of tricks to keep God from fulfilling his promise to the Jewish people. And I don't know about you, but maybe this sounds like a, a wild, epic, mythological tale that belongs in a movie theater rather than real life. But it's the big story. It's the meta-narrative. It, it, it's the story that's above all the other stories. It's, it's, it's playing in a universe near you. You can't watch the preview on YouTube, but you can read about it here. And one last thing about the last chapter, just to finish up. How should we be living in 2000? 13 in light of the events of 2012. Turn to Matthew chapter 24 if you have a Bible and, and let's just look real quick at what Jesus said, the way that we should be living. And by the way, as I go through these things, they're just things that we should be doing all along. They're not new things. They're the, they're the same things we should be doing, but my guess is that because of the urgency of the time, will be a little bit more motivated to actually really do it. Hopefully. Matthew chapter 24. So what's going on in Matthew chapter 24 is Jesus is talking about what the prophets said about these last days, that they're going to be pretty troubling. And, of course, they're getting nervous. They're already nervous that he said he's going to die. And now he's talking about, you know, how things are really, the wheels are going to come off the planet. And so in verse... Three, they say, so when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of your age? The end of the age. And so he gives them a bunch of things, which, by the way, he says 
are things that have never happened before to the degree that they've happened. And they will never happen that way again. So we're not there. This is somewhere in the future. I'm not here to tell you how long it's going to take before we get there. Because I don't know. It could be a year. It could be a thousand years. But he tells us to keep watching. And he starts mentioning things like there'll be a number of people who claim to be the Messiah. Be careful. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. And don't be alarmed. Things like that must happen before the end is to come. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. Remember, unlike anything that's happened before, anything that's going to happen again. These are just the beginning of birth pains, he says. And then in verse 10, he gives what I think is a template for the way that we should be living. And I want to give you four of those here. And I hope these are encouraging to you. I hope these are motivating to you. If they're not today, I'm guessing the events that are coming will be the motivation. But these are things that we should be doing all along. In verse 11, he says, and many false prophets will appear. Oh, in verse 10, it says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith. There actually will be a significant number of people who actually fall away from believing. And so number one, stay in the faith when you're tempted by doubt. My guess is it's going to be harder and harder to keep believing the things that you and I believe. Now, it might seem crazy now, or maybe it's not so crazy. Our faith is under attack in so many ways. And so the first thing is to stay in the faith, even if it feels like, I want to flee from it. Stay there. Don't leave. In verse 11, he says, And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So the second thing is stay in the word. Know the truth of God's word so you won't be led astray. There's a lot of great resources in this world, but there's really only one that really can tell you how to live your life in light of current events. It's the Word of God. If you're not in this every day, you're going to get off track. And I know there's a lot of attacks to try and tell you that this is not the Word of God. It only contains the Word of God. It's got a lot of errors and it's got a lot of inconsistencies. It's an ancient document. Those are all lies. None of that's true. This always has been and always will be the standard by which to live our lives. And God wants us to have a rich, full life no matter what's going on. In verse 12 and 13, it says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And so... It's already, we're already looking at events going, wow, it's getting creepy. But it's going to get creepier. And so it's easy in the, in the light of, of, of what's going on to be able to get cold hearts, to, to kind of turn off and to get weak knees, to get wobbly and get scared and, and anxious and, and worried about our own lives and about the lives of our kids and our friends and our family and about where things are going, God says, keep your heart warm. Keep your feet strong. It's time to be both soft and strong at the same time to get through those times. The world needs us to be this way. We don't ever stop presenting and representing the heart of God in us and through us. And the moment you shut down or you become bitter or you become antagonistic or you become militant, you've lost sight of God's heart. And then in verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so make the main point of your life about spreading God's grace. No matter what you do, if you're a homemaker, 
or you're a business person, or you're a student, whatever you do, it never changes. The best thing you can do with your life, no matter what you're doing with it, is to reach people, especially during those times when the world has is, is got so much trouble, to give them hope that they can have peace inside now and peace inside and outside when the Messiah returns. That is our hope. That is our hope. There is no other hope, my friends. I mean, I, I, I'm always, and you're probably always too, having to ask the question, if God is so good, why is this place so evil? And I don't have all the answers to that. I mean, I can give you some cheap answers. But the bottom line is, I didn't write the story. All I can do is have faith that God knows what he's doing. And that one day, it'll make sense. When the Lord returns and he rights every wrong and there is no more pain and no more suffering, no more crying and no more weeping, no more mourning, no more death, no more drama. That's our hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness, not ours. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, no matter how sweet it looks, but holy trust on Jesus' name. Our hope is built on Christ and Christ alone. The solid rock I stand. All other ground, it's sinking, stinking sand. <laughs> and so we're going to take communion together. I know this is a sobering message, and, and it's not typical of what we do here on Sunday morning, but it's vital to be able to, to, to kind of know what the story is and where is it going. But um, I'm going to ask you as, you, as you come down, those of you that are going to come down and take the blood through the grape juice, there's also wine here too, so be aware that we have both, and the matzah, the broken body, to not only remember that the spotless Lamb of God shed His blood and broke His body to pay for the sins of this world so that you and I can be set free from the consequences of sin and, and brought into this incredible life that God wants us to have. But also, that in 2013, maybe we could commit our hearts to those four things. And I'll remind you of them again. Stay in the faith whenever you're tempted by doubt. Stay in the word. Know the truth of God's word so that you won't be led astray. Keep your heart warm and your feet strong in the face of growing evil in the world. And make the main point of your life about spreading God's grace. Can you commit to that? So let's stand. And let me pray. Father, maybe somebody's here today who has never begun a journey of faith. And I, you know that we were all there at some point, not believing in you, not sure about you. And so first and foremost, I'd like to pray for them that maybe you'd soften their cold heart. And maybe for the first time that they're seeing a God who is so desperately in love with them that you would die so that we could live. And um, today's a great day. If you're, if you're somebody I'm speaking about, to just say yes to the offer that God has given us, a free offer just through faith. You don't, you, there's nothing to do other than just to say, yes, I believe. And then for all of us that are coming up, 
to partake of the cup and the bread, Father. Help us, Lord, to do these things, to be enabled to do these things, Father, that we've talked about today, that we might be blessed and be a blessing to others because our feet are on solid ground. And so make this a special time. I, I pray it would not just be some kind of a, a ritual that we do once a month. I pray you'd bring life to it as, as people come down, that there'd be a communion with you, an interaction with you. And so would you, would you fall, would your presence just fall on this congregation and meet each one of us in a special place? Whether we're struggling personally with our own drama or struggling with the drama that's going on in this world, God, meet us. Strengthen us, encourage us.